Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR Podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I am really excited to be joined by Heather Doshe. Heather is the Managing Director of People and Talent at SignalFire, uh, the newly minted Managing Director. We're going to get into that a little bit. She's about a month in on the job as we are recording this episode. So Heather, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, why don't you give the viewers and listeners a brief introduction on you? Yeah, thanks for having me, Lars. I'm so excited to be here. I would say long-time listener, first-time uh, participant, so exciting. Um, yeah, my name is Heather Doshe. Like Lars said, Managing Director of People and Talent at SignalFire. SignalFire is a venture capital fund that works on early-stage investments for tech startups, and my role is essentially to help folks, um, you know, as they're starting a company from zero to one, figure out all those pieces and kind of fill the gap until they have their own kind of robust people and talent function. Um, so it's a lot of advising, a lot of creating cool templates and, and things of that nature. Um, and even, you know, some search as well, helping people find those first hires to help them really succeed. Um, I do not have a traditional people and talent background. I came from um, the higher education world originally. If anyone actually feels like getting into that, we actually can. Um, but it's a uh, a very slow bureaucratic world. I thought I wanted to be a screenwriter growing up. Turned out I did not. Um, turned out that I am not the best at screenwriting, even though I love watching movies. Um, and so I had kind of one of those crises of confidence on my career when I was right out of college um, and did a whole career in university administration because that's what I knew were universities. And, you know, um, yeah, so fell into HR later. I guess we can get into that as well if you'd like. Um, but uh, basically, uh, have been spending probably the last seven or so years working in venture backed startups until this month, where I've helped companies as a first people and talent uh, hire, helping them grow their programs, their their services, um, you know, as they scale. Um, and I'm excited to finally be on the other side, where I get to sort of uh, become the person that serves what I once was a customer of. Yeah, well, there's a lot of expertise that you can bring into the kind of infuse in those early stage companies in your portfolio now. Um, screenwriting, was there a genre that you were, uh, that you envisioned yourself writing before you realized that wasn't for you? Yeah, so I love movies. I love like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's one of my favorite movies growing up. Um, but the movie that actually did it for me is there's a guy named Alan Ball. He actually wrote like Six Feet Under and other things too, but American Beauty. So, um, you know, to date myself, I guess. I was a senior in college. It was like, it had just come out. Um, or sorry, college, senior in high school. My gosh. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, what a beautiful story where like, you know, the ending for the beginning and how it all unfolded. And so I went and said, I'm going to start writing movies. And I wrote a movie on like notebook paper in my uh, bedroom growing up and thought, I'm going to be a screenwriter. Um, so I went off and got a creative writing major, but they didn't offer screenwriting until my junior year of college. So I was pretty far deep in the major, um, doing well, like thriving in poetry, even though I never thought I wanted to be a poet. Um, try screenwriting. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I had this crisis of what am I going to be when I grow up? I thought I was going to be a screenwriter. I don't think this is going to be a career that like earns a living. So I'm going to need to do something else. Um, and I just happen to be super involved in student affairs um, through like being paid like president and, you know, very involved in volunteer programs and all of these administrators that I worked with, like, you're already kind of doing what we do, but do you want to get paid for it? And that seemed very appealing at the time, but I was, I was pretty wrong. So. Yeah. The, the allure of getting paid for things is a, uh, is a strong, a strong draw. Uh, so you, you, you know, left college, you stayed in academia for a yeah. while and then you found your way uh, towards HR. So walk me through yeah. that shift. Um, what, what kind of, you know, led you from academia to the HR side? Sure. I feel like we've all had jobs that um, we think we really wanted to do until you got on the inside of that job. Like you, you've like, there's icebergs to everything. You see the top of the iceberg. That sounds cool. I want to do this or that. And then you get to see what 90% of the work actually is. And you realize not for me. And I think what I had realized um, was, you know, universities are very large bureaucratic organizations that have been around for hundreds of years and aren't super excited about change. Um, and I talk fast. If you can't tell, I also think fast and work fast and really like to just kind of be dynamic and how I work and creative. And it just was limiting. And I remember going to conferences, you know, in my field and everyone seemed so excited to be there. And I was like trying to figure out how to get to lunch faster. Uh, I just didn't have an interest in the topics as much as I once did. And um, what I realized what I was really interested in, in my job, that kind of point of my job that brought me joy was working with students and then tracking their careers afterwards. Um, these students that I would work with would come back and say, I'm interviewing for jobs. Do you want to look at my resume? And I was so excited to do that, which 
I was at women's programs, like a women's center, Greek life. Like this was not my job. I was not career services, but I thought, oh my gosh, like I am so much more fascinated in what they do next versus um, where they are when they're in the university world. And so I moved to San Francisco, um, started a doctoral program in organizational leadership because the dynamics of just organizations, whether it be a university or a friend group or, you know, it be a, a workplace, they're very fascinating to me. The power dynamics, kind of the interplay and the life cycle of all these things that happen and mapping the systems and how they happen to see like results and in inequities and things that happen, you know, as a result of tiny shifts um, was just so fascinating. So long story short, I thought, how do I get out of higher education and not completely embarrass my family because I was going to be a dean and they were very proud of that and they were telling all of our family and friends and um, I thought yeah I got to find a way out and so went and got the doctorate um, in order to kind of pivot my career and I figured this is a chance to study whatever I want um, in a way that was very academic focused um, where I came from but maybe a chance to pivot and I so happened to get that doctorate in San Francisco where all of my friends worked in tech um, and I would listen to what they did in their jobs and it was just so much more fast paced, so much more exciting. They mostly held sales jobs or recruiting jobs. And I thought, you know, they're actually quite similar in what you do day to day, but I would rather see where people are going in their careers. That's what I love um, versus selling a product. And so I chose the recruiting path. Um, and basically my final year of my doctoral program, I was writing my dissertation and I thought, now's the time to make the pivot. And so I'm like pretty close to the end. And, you know, it's funny, nobody cares that you have a doctorate um, in tech. And so it was kind of like, maybe a waste of three years, but not really. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I made the pivot. I like kind of came out to my parents and said, like, I'm going into tech. I want to join a startup. And they said, ooh, like, is that going to work out for you? Like, is that safe? Um, and luckily, looking back, you know, the last seven or eight years, they're kind of like, okay, this was a great choice for Heather. So yeah, you know, and it's interesting. I think when you look at the backgrounds of people in HR leadership roles, um, these days, especially, we're all over the place, right? Some of us, um, you know, came in and worked through the field the whole time. Some of us didn't even move into the field of HR until we were in that C-suite role and kind of came in from a, another function. Um, some of us had training and education in the field. Some of us had different disciplines and just found our way in here. So like for you, having that, you know, doctoral, having that kind of advanced education, especially in the field that you're now practicing, how did that help you as an operator, right? How, how did that kind of help you, that understanding of organizations and systems thinking, how did that kind of translate to your role now building companies uh, from the ground up? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think there are certainly upsides and downsides to any path because none of us can do all the paths, right? Like it'd be perfect if we said we had the doctorate, but we also did the, like, it would take longer to get from A to Z. And so I think there are, are nuances and pros and cons to each person's path. Um, I'm super non-traditional because I never, I've never held an HR generalist role in my life. I've never even held a director of people role in my life. I went from being basically in a recruiting like position at a company called Hired to becoming a head of people almost immediately and not having any of the formal training. Um, and so what I was able to do was really rely on that doctorate. Like you said, like I, I think the doctorate didn't teach me what to do. I never learned about employment law. I never learned um, even really, you know, what an HR function does. Um, in the doctorate, though, you pick a topic and you kind of go deep on it and you learn theories around it. And so it taught me how to think versus what to think. And so I had to fill the gap with a what. So when I joined, you know, I had to figure out what does an HR person do? How do I hire people who know it better than I do and learn from them? Where can I find communities to learn? The doctorate, however, taught me the things that I don't think you can get, um, you know, through just a traditional pathway, which is really how to think critically. Like in a doctoral program, you are reading with the point of pointing, like poking holes in an argument. So you're reading research papers and saying, this research is wrong and here's why. And you're actually, you know, almost incentivized to figure out why something is bad versus good. You're proving against something and then proving for something. And so what that kind of has taught me is, is a couple of things. One is like this idea of multivariate thinking. Um, so I kind of think from other people's perspectives than my own. So I'm not thinking you know, as an HR person, this is the policy that we need, or this is the program that we need, this is the solution. I'm thinking, what is this audience? Like, who is my audience, first of all? And what do they actually need from this? And how what can we do in a way that's scalable, that won't break down, that I can't poke holes in, say, a year from now? Um, and so it's kind of more just critical thinking skills. Um, that would probably be, and, and then I would say just also practically, I worked full time the entire four years during my doctorate. So I would say time management and balancing, um, 
the context switching, which is a really hard and real thing for a lot of people yeah. leaders is just your constant. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, I mean, the, the context switching, absolutely. Um, that is, uh, that is not easy and it's something that we're faced with every day. Um, you know, you, I know we mentioned at the top of the show that you, um, are a, a month as of when we're recording this into your new role, but I want to spend some time in the role you had before this. You spent about two and a half years with Webflow, um, you know, building them, leading them through scale and hyper growth, taking a team of two when you came in to 35. Um, and so, you know, tell me a bit more about that. I think specifically kind of looking back, especially having experienced that scale. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of listeners who are in head of people or, or you know, kind of newly minted uh, HR leadership roles who are going to be going through that scale uh, and taking their companies through that growth. Looking back at that experience, like with, you know, looking kind of comparing when you got there to when you left and, and looking back over that journey, what's one mistake you made that maybe with the benefit of hindsight, you would have done differently in the early stages as you were just kind of setting the foundation for growth? Um, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I think we all do. And if we're not making mistakes, we're not taking enough risk and and, and really growing. Um, but yeah, I think one thing that a lot of people in this role might see is that if they come in as the first head of people, and this is my second time coming in as a first head of people, um, you know, you show up and during an interview, you're trying to suss out what's already in place and what's what's there, what's not there. And then you kind of make promises. Oh my gosh, you need this, you need that. And that's how you kind of build that connection with the founders. And then you come in and you want to deliver on those things that you talked about during the interview. Um, but you might find out when you get there that there are a whole other host of things that are actually happening that maybe the things you discussed are no longer the right things. Um, and so I think then you kind of get to work on the right things. Um, so I think, you know, mistakes that I've made, uh, you know, at Webflow and in the past in general is just kind of coming in thinking, I'm going to do what I promised, even if it's not necessarily the right thing. So kind of having conviction for really taking the time to listen and look versus take for face value what people say is the thing um, and solve that. And I think, um, you know, tactically, one thing um, that I did at Webflow that did much too late was capacity planning um, and headcount planning. Um, and I know it's really a small thing, um, but there's very few products out there in this space for capacity planning. Um, and you know, I thought they said, you know, I come in, you need a sourcing strategy. Like that was sort of the, that's kind of the big thing. We, we have great people on the team, but we don't have good enough top of funnel. So we need you to come in and kind of build us a sourcing strategy. But I actually came in and there was no applicant tracking system. There was no hiring plan. There was no, all the basics, right? And this, and they were 90 people when I joined um, and they were doing a great job finding great talent. Um, and they thought that sourcing was the answer, but I realized infrastructure is the answer. Um, so yeah, so I would say capacity planning was probably my, my biggest, uh, miss because I waited a little too long to get that off the ground and it takes a few rounds to kind of iterate and be good at forecasting. Yeah. And I think, um, that's great advice. I think there's, you know, a lot of times when you go, when you're interviewing and you're kind of meeting with the founders, um, you're excited. They're telling you about their pain points. You're like, Oh, I, w I could do this. I could do that. And you know, you're almost making verbal commitments before you even have an offer. Uh, and then you get there and then, you know, you realize that the perspective you maybe got in those conversations was, you know, one or two dimensional. There's lots of other layers that would actually impact your strategy. And so I think that's really good advice to not maybe over promise um, and commit to things up front before you have a good enough understanding as to what the, um, you know, what's kind of under the hood, so to speak. Totally. Um, and I was going to just say that, like, you know, it's OK to have it wrong the first time because, Again, they've hired you for your set of expertise that you bring, and their their issues they were diagnosing were correct. There was a lack of great sourcing happening. That's true. Um, but sourcing is a layer on top of, say, the infrastructure. And so recognizing kind of like peeling back layers, like we're going to get there. Like you are totally correct. Sourcing is an issue, and let's let's fix that. But in order to do it right and to make it sustainable, we first have to do these three things. Um, and so I don't think it's like breaking a promise, but it's certainly kind of just the sequencing and getting that really right. Yeah. And wait, am I right in recalling that um, Webflow is fully distributed from the start? Yeah, so 20% um, of the team is in a San Francisco office um, and, you know, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Yep. Well, um, and then uh, since the pandemic, we also opened a, a Denver office. Um, and then the other 75 to 80% of the team is distributed around the world. I'm in Portland, Oregon, actually. I've been remote uh, with Webflow since the very beginning that I joined. And so how, you know, kind of being uh, there at an early stage in a predominantly distributed organization, how did that shape how you thought about kind of building culture 
um, in that kind of environment. And I think that that, you know, is, is you know, we're obviously at an era right now where um, most companies, especially in tech, are distributed to some extent, hybrid to some extent. Um, but a lot of them, especially the ones that were predominantly co-located before the pandemic, um, you know, we're still continuing to have questions around, like, how do you how do you create and strengthen and build those kind of connections in a distributed environment? So what, you know, what did you find as you were scaling Webflow? What, what worked well for you there? Yeah, honestly, it was actually a lot easier. Um, it was my third time being on a distributed team at a tech startup, um, and it was my second time leading the function. And so what I realized is that, um, you know, you can sort of be very remote first or say you are, but it's a lot easier to actually put uh, your words into action and kind of fulfill those promises if your team is truly majority remote. Because if many companies, they say like, oh, we've got a distributed team, but 80% is in co-located offices and 20% is off, you know, doing wherever, you're kind of planning for the minority if you're remote first, um, even though the idea is you're, you're planning for everybody, but it's not realistic. Like you see problems, you respond to them, but if the majority of the problems you're seeing are actually, um, you know, remote and distributed, it's easier. So my previous company, Rainforest, um, they were 70% in office and 30% remote. So even though you want to be remote first and plan around that, people are knocking on you know, your door, they're, they're tapping on your shoulder, they're saying, hey, I have a problem here. Um, and so just to back up, it's sort of when you go to look at Webflow, already coming in with the majority remote and me being remote and having that perspective was a lot easier to plan around. Um, and so I think you know, high level, you got to get your strategy right. You have to figure out like who we want to be. And you don't have to be remote first, but that's sort of the hot thing to be right now. So if you want to be that, like how do you back it up with really truly doing it? Um, and, and demographics is an easiest way to start because fundamentally you have it already there. And um, you know, I think one thing that most people are kind of getting wrong right now in this like pandemic era is they're experiencing what they think is remote work in a much easier way because when everybody is remote, um, it's not really hybrid. Everyone's doing remote. It's the same. They're planning for one group. But now as people start to go back to the office and companies have to decide who they want to be, do they want to be office centric or remote centric? That's where the complications really ensue because you're planning for two distinctive populations and it's to make them feel equitable. And so the remote first idea, I think it's generally because they already don't feel equitable because they don't have access to some of the things that people in office have. Um, and so the idea is you lift them up in order to kind of equate the whole. But now if like just a sparse number of people are going into the office, it's this very weird power shift and planning around that is a hard thing. So I don't have all the answers, but I think at the very highest levels, people sometimes make assumptions because they've now, I've done remote work for the last 18 months, I get it. It's gonna be very different when you've got a half and half population. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. And I think that, um, you know, there, there are a lot of organizations, especially, you know, looking at some of the data recently, a lot of companies that are being founded, um, you know, from the pandemic on there. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear for them to be kind of distributed first, um, you know, in, in that new model, because, you know, if they're forged in the pandemic, there weren't, you know, you didn't have the ability to have offices, you know. For CPOs and heads of people kind of moving, because right now many of us are in an environment where we're, um, we're interviewing, we're getting offers, and we're starting a company from our home. You know, we're not necessarily going on site. We're not meeting people. And I'm curious to get your perspective. Obviously, you've done this twice. You're doing this your third time now. Um, as a people leader who, you know, those early days, especially your first, you know, 90 days, 120 days, um, when you're really kind of establishing your um, – uh, your leadership, frankly, and, and your trust and your rapport with your uh, executive counterparts, as well as your team and the organization. Um, what advice do you have for maybe leaders who perhaps, you know, in the past, when they had been hired into a new role, they'd done that in a co-located environment where they could meet people, they could have meetings, they could have, you know, stand-ups, whatever it might be. Now they can't do those things. Like, what, what do you, do you, did you find anything worked particularly well for you, especially in those early onboarding days when you're kind of establishing those uh, those relationships and that trust and that rapport. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's so hard to do remote. I will say, you know, remote work has its benefits, but a majority of the remote work benefits are access to talent and flexibility of lifestyle for the employee. And that's kind of the win that happens there. But what is the downside is the relationship building um, because it's a lot harder to like see a box and feel really connected to that person versus going for a walk and getting coffee. And so I will say there's no replacement for physical in-person time. So yes, in a pandemic now, maybe not the best idea to te technically visit, but even if you're planning to be a remote leader or remote from your team, 
making the effort to go out and visit pretty regularly to kind of build that human connection so that when you show up back on the screen, you know who you're talking to. If you, if you do a Zoom call with your family, you don't feel disconnected from them because you know them so deeply and you lose that in the workplace. And so I'd say that's sort of part one. Um, and then knowing that that's not always an option, um, I think the other big thing I would say is just make space for the interpersonal. Um, it's so easy to be in a new job and want to show the team how much you can do and really deliver on all the things again that you promised in your interview um, and, and just slow down and kind of say, hey, like, I want to get to know you. Like, tell me about you. Tell me where you're from. Tell me, you know, your story. How did you find this company? And one thing that I sort of tend to do when I join a new, a new role is like an interview of sorts across the entire company. So meeting each person one-on-one -on -one across the company and getting to know them. And I spend the first few minutes understanding, why did you join this company? You know, tell me about how you got here. Um, and then I get to know them a little bit. Where do they live? Um, if we have something in common, kind of connecting on that. And I take like profuse notes on a notepad as it's going so that I can really remember the important things about that person as a human being. So in future meeting states, if we're sitting in a group, it's not like I'm, I'm being figured out. It's just hard to remember all the new people at once, but you kind of sit and you say, okay, like someone just mentioned this company right now. And we're talking about this other company. This thing. So-and-so told me they used to work there before they came here. I'm going to call them out in this moment and say, hey, you know, so-and-so used to work there and they've been working there for a long time and they're not acknowledging that. So kind of acknowledging people where they are or, you know, oh, we should think about a market in this location. And there's someone on that call who lives in that location or used to. I can say, didn't you used to live there? And so you're basically drawing these connections through really getting to know people over time. And so you're building trust and you're earning trust through um, the human side, not the work side. Um, and so I think the more you can kind of take space to learn the person and then um, integrate that into how you work together, you kind of have this integrated full person working relationship that then extends beyond. And I mean, I can't tell you how many personal calls I have with previous coworkers. I had one just the other day with someone I worked with in 2014 um, who's asking for career advice. And I also know how her, her babies do. Like we, we have like that integration of both of those things. And so I think just kind of being okay with that whole world. And, and I would just say that remote work is one of the huge benefits of remote work in terms of interpersonal is that you see my background, like this is my house, unless I use a virtual background, but this is my house. You get to know me. If my dog starts barking and I pick him up, like you're going to meet my dog, that wouldn't happen in an office. And so how can you, rather than try to make it feel parallel to an office, find what's unique about the situation that you're in, in the remote world and let that work for you. Um, I can't tell you how many people's kids I've met um, in the past year and a half, which is awesome. Yeah. You know, I'm really glad you made that last point because I do think, um, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, when we kind of shifted from office to remote, you know, we, we basically were operating in the same way that we operated when we were in office. We're just doing it digitally. We're, we're doing it through Zoom, but our behaviors haven't changed. The way that our operating kind of rhythms and cadence hasn't changed. Um, you know, we're still defaulting to synchronous uh, meetings and things around everything that we do as opposed to kind of asynchronous coordination and documentation and writing, um, which is really more oriented towards remote and distributed work. And so, um, yeah, I think that's just a great point that I, I'm glad you reinforced it. Um, and I want to talk to you a bit about your, you know, your now. So we, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of in this era and uh, both Heather and I are members of uh, the People Tech Partners community. And we recently had a conversation in a webinar around um, uh, really just the, the the impact of the last 18 months on the CPO role and then the amount of turnover that we're seeing, um, people transitioning uh, to other roles, um, people stepping away entirely, people moving into uh, new industries and environments. And, you know, that those categories apply to all of us, right? But, uh, but you're in one of those categories. I think there was maybe, what, 10% of 280 survey respondents um, left the kind of corporate operator HR role to another area of the business or um, consulting in the VC side. And obviously you moved over to the VC side. So tell me about that transition. Like we're in this market right now where you probably could have done lots of different things, uh, but you chose to kind of, uh, you know, move away from the operator seat, move into the VC side. What was the the trigger for that for you? What, what kind of drove you there? So, yeah, I mean, gosh, this market is, is wild for heads of people right now. I mean, I, I think I was averaging like seven to 10 outreaches per month for jobs, just like the one I had at a different company. And I'm not even probably the most, you know, skilled experienced person out there. So if I'm getting that, I can't imagine what some of these, you know, top names out in our industry are, are getting. And so I feel for your inboxes and for you. But um, for me, what I realized was like, every time I'd see things, I don't want to do this again. And I think the reason why for me is not, not the pandemic necessarily, like, I don't mind context switching. I don't mind crisis management. I actually love working on DEI programs, which were really prominent over the past bit, whether it be from a mental health standpoint due to, you know, you know, 
anti-racism standpoint, all these different areas were fun. For me, what really kind of got me to realize I wanted to shift roles, and I think, you know, maybe the pandemic gets everyone reflective because they're kind of forced to kind of really look at everything in their life. So this could be part of it. But but for me, what it really was is that I kept graduating almost out of my job, or maybe flunking would be the better way. And not, not in a way of like I wasn't doing well, but in a way of the things that bring me joy in a job were not the things I was doing by the time I was excelling in that job. And so um, if you think about, say, you join a company, there's nothing there, like not nothing, there's stuff happening, but there's very little infrastructure. Like I mentioned at, at Wevel, there was no applicant tracking system, no headcount planning process, like no HRIS that was fully built out yet. There were a number of things that were not even off the ground. And I got to go in and figure out how to build those things. The team was two people doing 80 different micro tasks. I got to figure out how to organize the structure of the team and grow it to become multiple departments, you know, from IT to recruiting to people. I mean, it was a lot of fun to build. And I love that building. Um, I love creating documentation. Like, I know it's silly, but I was a writing major. I love just writing thoughts, writing handbooks, writing learning materials. Um, I love doing. And I have a real strong bias for action. And each time I would join a company and do it, the first year was magical because I was mind blown working on all the things, but I would be successful. The company would grow and suddenly I had this team. And like you mentioned earlier, a two person to a 34 person team, I'm no longer the one doing, I'm the one delegating. I'm the one creating a vision and then sending all the things I really want to work on off to my team. And I'm so happy for them to have those opportunities. But for me, I felt like, gosh, like I'm sitting in executive meetings all day discussing business strategies and then taking the information and figuring out how to synthesize it, send it back to my team to inspire them to go off and do the work. And I wanted to be a builder. And I realized that if I joined another tech startup and did the same journey from, you know, zero to one over again, that I would just end up in the same spot. And full disclosure, I'm 37 years old. I hope I can retire by 50 or so, but I'm probably not going to. And even if I did, that would be another six times doing this job. And that feels like Groundhog's Day. That's not what I was signing up for. And so for me, what I realized I needed to do was to figure out a sustainable path for me to keep doing what I love, which is building out these programs, building out these resources, helping founders, but in a way where I wouldn't graduate after two and a half years over and over again. And so I ultimately realized like there are sort of two paths I could have taken. One is this VC path where I've been working with great VC talent partners for the past you know, several years, and they get to help so many companies in these micro slices across their business, um, and they can help them build, they can help them grow things that I love doing. And the teams never get that big. They're very lean teams on VC side. And so they're always the one doing, they're never kind of managing a, a bloated org. Um, and then the other path would be a consultant, you know, work like what you do, Lars, or like, you know, Shelby Wolpa is doing great work in this area and getting to really pick and choose what you want to help with and do that thing over and over again. Um, I chose the VC path because when I saw the signal fire opportunity, it was too good to pass up. I did not take a single interview across the hundreds literally of jobs that were reached out to for me over the past year. I didn't take a, a single one. I passed them all on to the network. Um, but when I decided I want to go and look before I leap on this VC path versus consulting, I reached out to a few folks and I kept hearing over and over, Signal Fire is doing this differently. They really value the talent and people functions. They're really helping people. They're standing behind their promises. Um, you should just look into them. They're probably not hiring, but go talk to the team, learn what they do so that when an opportunity arises, you could tackle it the way that they do. Um, and so I reached out to the team and it just so happened they were opening a role. Um, and so I got very, very lucky in that I interviewed at one place um, and I found them. They didn't find me um, and it just all worked out. And so I feel really excited because now I get to work with 120 different companies across all of their stuff and get better through repetition across many places, um, build resources for all of them, get on these calls and kind of get a window into their world and help them with something, but then go off and do that with someone else versus owning sort of the, the maintenance work that comes with kind of running an org over time. So long answer, but to me, it was just this very powerful aha moment of um, like what I really want to be doing with my life. Yeah, you know, it's like this whole, obviously, the, the experience of going through a global pandemic and, and everything that's happened, right? It's not just that. There's so much that's happened in the last 18 months. I think it's caused a lot of introspection. And I've actually, this is not the first time that I've heard people, um, you know, kind of contemplate on on what does bring them joy in their work. Um, and if they're not finding it, a lot of the people I've talked to who've taken time off or who, who've left surprisingly roles that I, I didn't expect them to leave. 
it was a joy factor. They just kind of said, look, I just kind of, you know, assess the things that I'm doing and the things that bring me joy and kind of fill me up. And the things that I'm doing are the things that drain me, not fill me up. And, and when you're, you know, obviously the work, you know, some things will be draining some things will, will give you energy. Um, but, but it, it's about trying to find that balance. And when the balance is gone and everything you're doing is things that may drain you, um, that's, that's unsustainable long term. And so it's, it's just, it is really interesting to hear you kind of mention this as well in terms of like really having that own uh, internal thought process around the things that, that bring you joy. So oh, yeah. um, it's been fascinating learning more about like your career path and your journey. I want to, uh, we close out every episode with a lightning round to help the uh, viewers and listeners get to know you a little bit better. So are you ready to jump in? I'm scared, but I'm ready. Don't be scared. This is, uh, <laughs> this, we're we're going to have fun with this. Um, all right. I'm a huge music nerd, so we're going to start with Spotify. I'm checking out your Spotify playlist. Uh, who am I going to learn are your top three artists? Okay, I have maybe a top 100, um, and I probably say more <laughs> my playlist. I have a playlist called The Greats, and it's songs that I want to hear no matter kind of my mood. I'll always be excited that they come on, and people you would hear on that particular playlist are Lumineers, Lizzo, Fleetwood Mac, that's three. I could keep going with like Bob Dylan. I mean, I could keep going. So I'll stop there. But no, you 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 demonstrated <laughs> the rage. So that's a uh, that, that is, that's a solid playlist already. Um, what is your least favorite buzzword or least favorite HR buzzword? I should say. Mm, um, it's a toss up between diverse hire um, and culture uh, fit. And I think people talk uh, a lot about culture fit, but I just want to give a plug for why you should not say someone is a diverse hire is how othering that is. Um, and there are diverse teams because diversity comes from difference. Um, and so when you're calling somebody different, you're othering them. And that just like hurts my heart. Like I get the chills thinking about it. Um, when I've been called a diverse hire, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> like now I feel like a token. And so how can you think about diverse teams, but maybe a hire that's underrepresented in tech. So different from the norm in a group, but not different from us. Yeah. And let, I mean, let's just call that what it is. When you're, when you're saying a diverse hire, you're centering whiteness period. Like that's what, that's what you're doing. And, and so I think I, I'm with you on that term. I, I cringe every time I hear it because it just, it, you know, people are just, they're not really thinking about the context when they're using that phrase and it is completely othering. So yeah, I'm, it I'm feels fully with you. Like it feels like they don't really, they're not taking the time to learn. And so they're just, yeah, it's just too much for me. Yeah. Um, if you weren't working in HR, what would you be doing? Well, screenwriting is no longer an option either. Um, <laughs> my, I, you know, secretly I would be like a lady of leisure. Um, just kind of like doing things that I love doing and, and, uh, traveling a lot. But, um, if it was a job, let's see, I think I'd still want to be a writer, but maybe, um, uh, you know, more, more narrative, um, or even more business writing. And uh, last question for you. Um, who is one HR leader in the field that you admire and why? I admire so many people. Can I say, can I say you? Uh, I, you, I mean, you can, then you'll make me blush and then I'll make okay, you pick somebody me. else. <laughs> okay. So um, one of the reasons why I joined Signalfire of many is that they have retained some of the most amazing people across different industries. So there's expertise across the board. And so when I got to meet during my interview process and now work closely with is Tawny uh, Nazario Kranz. Um, she is the former CHRO of Netflix um, and Waymo. And she is just so brilliant when it comes to coaching leaders. And again, where I think my strengths are is building programs, seeing systems. Her strengths are so clearly in the coaching aspects. And so I'm really excited that I just, through osmosis, I'm going to learn so much from her that will help me make me a better, more rounded leader. So. That's great. Well, uh, Heather, thanks so much for coming on the show, sharing your uh, your career journey, your wisdom. I'm definitely wishing you all the best in the new role, and I'm excited to see what you build there. Thank you so much, Lars. This has been a lot of fun.